for those of you who don't know me, my name is Reed Work. I am the worship leader at the Brainerd Downtown Campus, which usually meets across the way. Uh, but this morning, we're uh, excited to be able to join the BX gym service. I'm excited to be here in this space with you guys. And regardless of whether this is a, maybe a different space for us to gather or the same old, same old for you, um, we're here praising the same name. That's Jesus. And so let's sing out loud together, worshiping him with all that we got.
Uh, it's Will Campbell, your downtown campus pastor. I'm obviously filming this right now in my kitchen, and that's because, as many of you guys are aware, uh, Taylor and I both tested positive for COVID earlier this week. And so 
Uh, I think there's a few things I need to say after I say that. Uh, number one, we're doing well. Uh, we're actually doing very well. Both of our symptoms now are very mild. We're both recovering really well. Um, and so you need to hear me say that. Uh, number two, uh, we do covet your prayers. And we're very thankful for your prayers. We're very thankful for your support. Uh, over the past few days, we have gotten more cookies and lasagna. I mean, gosh, the, the lasagna that we've gotten over the past few days could feed at least 10 families. So we're very thankful for the prayers. We're very thankful for the support. We feel very loved. Um, but also the third thing is this. You need to hear say this. We, we miss you guys. Uh, we, we really hate that we're unable to be there, especially this weekend, a weekend that really is the last weekend for a lot of our college students to be here. And so um, Guys, we, we, we miss you. Brainer Downtown, we really miss you guys. Everybody else, it's good to see you. It's been a while. So um, with that being said, one of the ways that they allowed us to be a part of the worship experience today uh, is through the giving moment. And so, guys, I just want to remind you as we go into this moment that this is another opportunity for us to worship the Lord our God. Um, and, and as we shift into this, I, I really think that it's important just to remind you guys what we just left in our series on giving. Again, we just left a four-week series on stewardship and tithing and giving. And really the whole focus of that series was Paul continuing to point the Corinthian church back to the gospel in order to find motivation to give, in order to find motivation to be generous. And so that's exactly what I'm going to do here. Friends, we give not out of obligation. We give not out of this sense of just duty. We are obligated to give because Jesus has called us to, right? But we give for more than that. We give out of a sense of thankfulness and joy because we give out of the overflow of what God has given to us through the gospel, which is Jesus, which is life, which is hope. And so, friends, as we enter into this time, consider those things. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you, and um, God, any time that we're able to gather together in worship, every time that we're able to, to gather together and sit under your word, um, God, it's something that we should celebrate. It's something that we should take advantage of. It's something that we should treasure, um, but God, it's also something that we should anticipate leaving looking different, and so God, today, as we worship you in song, as we worship you in giving of our money, of, of the things that you've given us, our resources. But God, also as we sit under the teaching of your word, God, let us be a people who are changed today by you, changed by your word, changed by your spirit. God, allow us to leave today looking more like you and looking more in your image. And so Jesus, we love you. Um, we confess that we desperately need you, especially in the season that we're in as a church family. So God, we love you, we need you, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Brainerd family. We're thankful um, to have another guest talking to us about what it means to be committed to serve. And uh, so this morning, I have the pages with me. Can you guys just tell me who you are, uh, what you do, maybe what life group you're in, or who are the pages? I'm Karen Page, and um, we have been at this church for 28 years, and we have three kids and two grandgirls. Right now, we uh, currently serve in the college ministry, and we are in the core group for the downtown church campus, and just loving every minute of it. We have a life group along with the Kids Millers that um, is associated with it, and we will be uh, meeting for the third time, so it's brand new. I've heard you guys say that you've served in lots of different places for a, a long time. Um, what's motivated you to serve in that way? Why, why do you guys serve? We want to serve our church, and we want to be um, a light to our church. There's just endless things that you can do to serve the Lord. One of my things that I've always taught our children is to love one another. And you love one another because Christ loved us first. At least for me, the desire to serve is twofold, just between the connecting with um, like-minded or um, people, of, people of faith as it is uh, just as much to follow the directive of Christ. 
I don't really consider what we do as service. It, We're just you know, loving one another. Um, it's more of an opportunity to, um, you know, to help out. Uh, you've served in lots of different places. Is it worth it? What would you say, what would you say to the person when they ask you, is it worth it? A thousand times, yes. I just want you to hear me say thank you on behalf of Brainerd Baptist Church for the way that you've done that over the years. And you also represent lots of other people just like you who do that every week and they've been faithful and nobody, they may not ever know their names, um, but they were the people that were standing at the door greeting people or changing uh, diapers of their children or uh, fixing coffee or whatever it is. And I just want you to, I want you to hear from me. Thank you. We appreciate what you do. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure and an honor and a joy. Good morning, Brainerd Faith family. Great to see you. Let's study the Bible together. Let me ask you to open to 1 Peter chapter 4 in your copy of God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 4. Um, while you're turning there, uh, let me... Just say my word of welcome to those of you that are part of the, the downtown uh, campus and that venue. Uh, thank you for your flexibility, as Will indicated. Uh, grateful to see you. By the way, my name is Jim Shaddix. I know I haven't had the opportunity to meet or maybe even see uh, many of you, uh, but I want you to know how thankful to God I am uh, for you and for what uh, he's doing for his good grace in your lives and what this is going to mean in the advancement of the gospel uh, in Chattanooga and beyond. So uh, thank you for doing that. And again, glad to have you as a part of this time. Uh, those of you that are part of the 1130BX, great to see you again. Uh, always thankful uh, for your faithfulness in these times that we worship the Lord through the study of his word. First Peter chapter 4. Uh, if you came in today and you don't have a copy of the Bible or an electronic version that you can turn on, um, maybe there's somebody in your group that would let you uh, look on with them because I, I want you to see and follow along as we see what God has to say to us today. Let me read over you 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. The apostle Peter is the human author, but he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so this is the word of the Lord uh, for us today. Verse 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. It's interesting how the New Testament talks about the end times. It's uh, quite a bit different than most of the conversations that we hear in our day and time, even in the church, about the end times. You know, we, we never on the pages of the New Testament uh, find uh, the, the New Testament writers talking about the end times in order to get us to put a date on the calendar, to, to identify when that is going to happen exactly. We really don't find uh, anything in the New Testament about charting it out and making sure we got all of the T's crossed and the I's dotted and every little detail worked out. We, we really don't even ever find, uh, you know, a, a instruction to uh, make sure that we unpack all of the specifics of all of the prophecies and study them in detail so we know exactly how each one matches up with the course of history. And there's, there's not a lot, church, e even about, uh, you know, us spending our time uh, gazing into the skies, waiting for Jesus to break through the crowds. 
What's, what's interesting is when the New Testament talks about the end times, most of the time, if not all, it's talking about them in terms of how our expectation of that ought to affect the way we're living today. And, and, and you know, for some believers, that, that kind of takes the luster off of it. I mean, because we love studying about the end times and we love mapping it all out and we just think, you know, and, and thinking about all that. But when it comes down to how that should impact how I go to work today, you know, or how I go to school today or how I treat my wife today or respond to my parents or whatever the case may be, that, that there, there seems to be a, a separation, a compartmentalization in those, those categories. Well, it's exactly what Peter is dealing with here. He's talking about the end times, but he's talking about them in terms of how that would affect our conduct. He's been writing here to believers in Asia Minor who were living under intense persecution. I mean, their world was falling apart, if you will. Complete chaos, you know, going on. And it's interesting how in times like that, there, you have a tendency to kind of lose sight of some of these things and just throw everything out the window. But in, in the context of his conversation, he's obviously spoken to them about how the time is coming. In verse 5, he says, they, they will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. And so he's speaking about the time when Christ comes and will judge the earth and then comes to this paragraph right here and says, the end of all things is near. Now, let me tell you what Peter's doing. He's, he's compelling believers to live in a certain way. Put it simply, to live godly in, in, in the end times. If you go back in your Bible and look up at verse 2, he, he says, you know, you're to live the remaining time in the flesh, in your earthly body, no longer for human desires. It's too many of you have been doing that, he says. There hadn't really been a difference in, in, in what your life looks like and what the world's life, you know, people in the world look like. He said, it's, you've wasted a lot of time doing that. You, you don't need to do that any longer, living for human desires. But look at this, but for God's will. And so what, he, what he's going to do in verses 7 through 11 is tell us how to do that. And we, we know that if you look and see that, that word, therefore, in the middle of verse 7. Look down at your Bible. In the middle of verse 7, he says, therefore. So he, he's just said, the end of all things is near. Therefore, live like this because of that truth. And, and you know what? He was exactly right. The end was near. Everything on God's redemptive timeline had taken place that's going to take place before Jesus comes. No question in my mind, Peter thought Jesus would probably come back in his lifetime, 2,000 years ago. And you say, well, he really missed it. He didn't miss this. He, he lived the same way you and I ought to live, and that is with the expectancy that it could happen any day, because it could. I mean, you look back through biblical history, and, and we, we see creation, we see the fall, we, we see the call of Abraham, we see the, 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 the kingdom of Israel being brought, we see the exile into Babylon, the return from exile, we see the coming of Christ, the birth of Christ, we see the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ back to heaven and, and, and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, you know, to establish the church. And from that point on, from that point on, if we understand what Joel the prophet said and other New Testament, uh, Old Testament and New Testament writers, everything has taken place before the coming of Christ and we have been living in the end times since that day. Peter knew that. And so when he says this, the end of all things is near, he was accurate, was near in comparison to all of biblical history, and it's true for us today. The end is near. And so, under the inspiration of the Spirit, Peter says, all right, believers, here, here's how you ought to be living. Here's how you live godly according to God's will as you wait for Christ's return. Now, if you're like me, you might think at that point, then what's about to come is just like earth shattering stuff. I mean, this is going to break the bank. He's about to lay down some 
heavy stuff that's never been said before and, you know, this is new information. But that's not what he does at all. He actually, in this paragraph, if you were tracking a moment ago, when I say he, he actually talks about some very basic stuff to the Christian life. Great reformer Martin Luther was asked one time, what would you do if you knew that Jesus was coming back today? Luther said, I'd plant a tree and pay my taxes. Not very profound. Why? Because Luther lived every day in expectation that Jesus was going to come. And so he said, if it's today, I'm just going to check boxes off on my to-do list like I do every day. Well, it seems that that's kind of what Peter's doing here. He's just kind of giving us a peek at at least what our to-do list ought to look like while we're waiting for Jesus to come back. Now, I'm not telling you what's here is exhaustive. There's a whole lot more in the New Testament about, you know, how we ought to live and things we ought to be doing. But this is this paragraph that the Holy Spirit inspires Peter at this point to say to these believers and through them to us, here's how you live godly as you wait for Christ's return. So let me show you this to-do list. The first item on our list ought to be this. Pray for one another soberly. Pray for one another soberly. Look at the back side of verse 7. He says, remember, he's just said, end of things is near, all things is near. Therefore, here's the first thing he says, be alert and sober-minded. So in the language of the New Testament, these two words, they're very similar in meaning. They're, they seem to be almost used synonymously here just for emphasis, kind of a double punch here. And the idea is stay awake. Jesus talked about this you know, before, his, before he, he left this, this earth. He said, stay awake, be alert, be sober in your thinking, Peter says. Now, he seems to be contrasting that with something you read about the world's desires back up there in verse 3. There's already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do. Again, already wasted enough time doing that. And here's what they do, carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. Just, just life out of control. And here, Peter comes down here and he says, don't let that happen to you. And and he doesn't seem to be talking about from a physical standpoint. Watch this. Come in here real close. He seems to be talking about the way we think. The way we think about what's going on in the world. The way we interpret stuff that is happening today. Now, I... I'm probably older than most of you in this room. There are a few of you that are, you know, up there where I am and maybe beyond. But I got to tell you, I've never in my lifetime have never seen a day that seemed to be so out of control politically, socially, all across the board. I mean, I'm looking at the news every day thinking, are you people nuts? I I look at, at political statements and I think, do you really believe that? I mean, aren't you doing the math here and putting that together? I, don't you know what that would lead to? And, 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 and are, you, are you looking beyond this? And I, I'm just seeing this, this thinking that it just seems to be off the charts, wild. And Peter comes to believers right here, and certainly he didn't want them to be drunk physically, uh, intoxicated, you know, with, with alcohol, but, but he's talking about the way we think. And this happens to a lot of believers. People, listen, I know a lot of Christians that, you know, either because of what's going on in culture, it's just like they check their brains at the door and, and, and they start being gripped with worry and anxiousness. They start thinking crazy. They start checking out, throwing out, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Christ-like life and just, you know, trying to take things. Into that. I see this with people in, in, in relation to studying the end times and thinking about the end times. It's like, it's like they just go crazy. They go off the charts, out into a ditch somewhere, just with regard to getting consumed with, trying to map it out, pick the day, hunkering down, just waiting for Jesus to come. And what does Peter say? First thing on the list, he says, don't check your brain at the door. You you ought to be looking at culture. I ought to be looking at culture. We ought to be reading the news every day through the lens of Scripture, through the lens of the gospel. And that's got to mean something different for us than it does the world. Now, watch this. 
Peter's not saying, I want you to think soberly as an end in and of itself. He wants us to think soberly so that it might lead to something. Notice in verse 8, so verse 7, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. How about that? Language of the New Testament, these words for prayer is a purpose clause. They're, they're connected to both of those words that come before. Peter's essentially saying, I want you to think soberly so that you pray more effectively. And you see, that's in game on this particular word of instruction. He, he, he makes the assumption that the more things are spinning out of control in this world, the more chaotic they get. And I, I've said to you before, listen, they're not going to get better. This is just going to get worse and worse. There may be seasons where we take a step back or take a step up. But in general, this world is spinning out of control and it's, it's, it's going to get worse. And Peter says, I, I want you to interpret. I want you to read the news. I, I want you to watch what's going on. And I want you to be sober-minded about it because you're looking through the lens of the gospel because that will enable you to pray for one another more effectively. You see, if, if, you, if you look at the world rightly, you're, it, it's going to compel you, number one, to greater dependence upon God, which is going to drive you to prayer. And in that praying, you're going to know how better to pray for me. You're going to pray more in keeping with the will of God. You're going to pray with greater confidence that you're calling out to the sovereign God of the universe that's not surprised or caught off guard by any of this. And that's going to enable you to pray for me and me to pray for you uh, through the lens of Scripture, through the God lens, a lens that appeals to him based on his will. will. And John says that that's the kind of praying that is always on target. It always finds a hearing, an audience in God, and he always responds to it. And that's the way I need you to pray for me. That's the way you need me to pray for you. It's, it's the way you need each other to pray. It's the way you need your friends, your small group folks praying for you through a sober-minded lens. Beloved, when we're interpreting culture rightly, and we're not going off the rails and just getting crazy with all of this like the world is doing, then we're driven instead to greater dependence upon God and greater effectiveness in our prey. So, so how, do, how does what's going on in the world today make you feel? How do you find yourself responding to that? Is it making you more anxious? Does it make you nervous? Decisions that are made, votes that are taken, candidates that are in office, does it, does it cause you to be concerned about wondering where all of this is going? Or are you looking at all of that stuff through the lens of Scripture, thinking about it with a sober mind, and therefore it compelling you, and compelling me to pray for brothers and sisters in Christ and to do that more effectively? So item number one on the task list is to pray for one another soberly. Item number two, love one another graciously. Love one another graciously. Peter does hear what Jesus does, what Paul does, and that is he, he seems to look at this idea of loving one another on a little bit different plane. You look at it in verse 8, he says, above all, even though he's already put one thing on the list and he'll put something on the list after it, he comes to this one right here and he says, above all, above all, maintain constant love for one another. Peter knew what Jesus had said. You go back to Matthew's gospel and check it out. Jesus was talking about the end times. He said this. He said, the love of many will grow cold. And, 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 and Peter knew that this was a reality. The closer we get, the, the, the more impending it seems, this, this, this return of Christ has come, the more distracted we're going to be tempted to become. And, 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 and all of the, getting caught up in everything and getting thrown off with all of this stuff. And you know what that's going to do? It, it, it's going to take some of the attention off of this most important item on our, our to-do list. And that is that we, we love one another. Our, our love for Christ, we, it will be challenged. The more pushback there is against the gospel, the, 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 the more pushback there is against the gospel, the more our faith will be challenged. We will be tempted to shrink back into the shadows. And certainly 
we will be tempted to disconnect from one another. After all, if the world's aiming at you, why, man, why, don't, why do I want to hang out with you? Why, why do I want to be around you if you're a target? Those are going to be the temptations. That's why Jesus said what he said. Peter knew this. So he, he says here in verse 8, you need, to, you need to stoke the fires. You will constantly need to stoke the fires. So here's the deal. You and I can't be passive about this deal. We can't presume upon it. We can't just quote Jesus saying, hey, this is how the world's going to know you're my disciples, that you love one another. We, we, we can't just get caught up in the familiarity with Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, following 1 Corinthians 12 on spiritual gifts saying, hey, if you don't get this right, spiritual gifts are not going to matter. He takes love to this level. We, we can acknowledge all of those things, but the reason this is on the list, beloved, is because we got to be intentional about it. We got to be intentional about expressing love one another and demonstrating the love of Christ, which by the way, is, is what we were shown. We were the recipients of, you know why we do this? The apostle John said it, we, we love because Christ first loved us. Pastor Will was talking about a moment ago about all of this, our financial giving, our, 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 our serving giving, our life giving, being driven by the gospel. Well, no place is that more clear than right here. But it's not going to be automatic. It's not going to just happen because we are believers and we've got the gospel. It's on the list because it, it needs attention. It, it needs attention from us. we got to be proactive about this. Now, Peter gives us a reason why this is so important and why love is so important. At the end of verse 8, and, and he, he's, he's probably alluding to, if not quoting, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12 here. But notice what he says here in 1 Peter 4, 8. He says, above all, maintain constant love for one another since love covers a multitude of sins. Now, let me tell you what Peter's not saying. Peter's not saying our love for one another has anything to do with whether or not our sins are atoned for. You know, you look at that and you say, gosh, I, I need to start loving people better because that, you know, that's going to affect whether their sins are forgiven or my sins are forgiven. No, that, that's not what Peter said. That would fly in the face of all of the New Testament teaching. I, I just want to remind you, believer in Christ, your sin, my sin was atoned for fully on the cross. Every sin you've ever committed, every sin you commit today, every sin you ever will commit was atoned. That's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus did this. And if you're here without Christ today, let me just, let me kind of press pause in speaking to all these Christians here and say a word to you. I want you to hear this. And I want you to know that this is the gospel. This is what the New Testament teaches. It teaches that Jesus came to live a life you can't live. Quit trying to be good enough. Or quit not trying because you think you never will be good enough. You know what? You're right. You will never be good enough. That's why Jesus had to come. He had to come to live a life you can't live, a perfect life that meets God's standard. But watch this now. Then he died a death you should have died and I should have died. He went to the cross and took your sin, and there he incurred the wrath of God. He stepped in between you and me and the wrath of God. He took our place, and there in his death, he atoned for all of our sin, that which separates us from God. But then he rose from the dead, and he rose from the dead to put the life of God back inside of you and me, the life of God you were created to have. And if you're here without Christ today, if you're joining us by live stream, which we're so grateful for you doing, if you're here without Christ today, you're listening without Christ today, hear this gospel. And I plead with you, let today be your spiritual birthday. Let today be the day that you acknowledge what I just said. You recognize and you tell Jesus, I, I get this now. I know you did this for me. And the only way for me to be in the family of God is because of what you did. So I'm asking you, I'm asking you to take my life. Forgive me of my sins and, and put God's life back inside of me. Do that right there at your seat, in your own words, in your heart of arts. But cry out to God and embrace this gospel because you know what? What Jesus did on the cross is the only way for any of our sins to be atoned for. 
Our sins are not atoned. Christians, come back in here. Our sins are not atoned for because we love one another. What's he talking about here? Well, he's talking about what all of us know about love. If you've ever loved someone, and I'm sure that everybody in here, even if it's not a, you know, a, a romantic relationship, you know, with, with your family, love does something pretty cool, and that is it overlooks a lot of stuff, right? I mean, husbands, your wives, they cut you a lot of slack, man, because they love you. Amen. Our wives, that's a good place to say amen, Sha. Thank you for that. Good, timely place. They overlook a lot of stuff because they love us. And ladies, you do the same thing. We do it with our children. We do it with our parents. This is what love does. True love is patient and it's kind. And it doesn't make a big deal out of everything. Every hill is not worth dying on. Love doesn't just store up a lot of things. Doesn't say anything in the immediate, but storing it up, just waiting for the right time to throw it up in somebody's face. That's not what love does. Love, love overlooks a lot of sin. So Peter, Peter kind of makes this more practical here, doesn't he? I mean, it's one thing to say, hey, you guys keep loving one another. Stoke the fires of love. It's another thing to say, okay, here's how you do it. You, you do it by not a big deal out of stuff that doesn't need to be a big deal. You do it by being patient with one another. But look, Peter even gets more practical because he... He takes that now and he applies it to a specific situation in their day. And that's where verse 9 comes in. Peter says, be hospitable to one another without complaining. So he reaches into the culture of believers today in which they were compelled to use their homes to to be hospitable, to show hospitality. You see, in that day, there wasn't a holiday inn on every street corner. No Hampton Inns. And, and the inns, the hotels, if you will, that they did have, most of them were kind of shady. They, they were, they, they were kind of risky. And so it was imperative that believers would open their homes and show hospitality. It was particularly important because of traveling uh, apostles and evangelists were out spreading the gospel. If they were going to take the gospel to some place that didn't have it or uh, a place where a church needed to be planted, they were going to have to have a place to stay. And so this was a part of the regular Christian economy during that day. Now, you just kind of picture it in terms of, you know, here, if you want to get a visual for this so I can make a point. You know, I come here every week from Wake Forest, North Carolina. You're very gracious to uh, pay for my travel, my expenses. You give me a hotel to stay in and a rent car, and, and you really, nobody ever has to worry about it. But let's just pretend for a moment that this was happening back in that day. I'd have to stay at your house. Hmm? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, oh, Shaddix, we, 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 we'd be glad to have you in our home. But let me tell you something, that gets old real quick. I mean, it wouldn't be a couple of, you know, weeks before you're looking at your spouse or your roommate saying, is he coming back next week? How long are we going to keep doing this? Now, I want you to add something onto that. Let's just say that I am staying with you a couple of weekends and and then, you know, one day we're sitting at the dinner table at your house and, and I say to you, you know, you, you folks have been so gracious. You've hosted me and I, I just, I really love y'all and I appreciate that. And I love Chattanooga. I think I'm going to stay a few days and see the sights. And so I put that on the table. And maybe at the end of the week, it time, gets time for me to go back home. It's past time for me to do that. And I, I say to you, I say, well, you know, listen, uh, you know, thank you for hosting me. It's been a great week. I need to go back home now. But you know what? I didn't plan very well. I'm not sure I got enough money to eat on the way home. Would you spot me a few bucks? Now, let me tell you what I just described to you happened in those days. Not with all of the travelers, but there were some. There were some who were false apostles. They were false evangelists. They were false teachers. But there were also some who were authentic. They just didn't have much tact. And so sometimes they cross lines. They overstayed their welcome. They asked for money. And, and, and do you know what, what it did for these believers? Well, it, it did the same thing for them that it would be for you. The, the welcome of these guests got worn out really quick. And so let me tell you how some of them responded. Some of the believers responded the same way many of us respond, just to use an illustration, to homeless people in our day and time. We look at that and we... 
We say, well, you know what? There's some people, this is just a game. They're doing it for a racket. And I don't want to be taken advantage of, and I don't want to feed the problem. So I'm just not going to get involved. And so we put all homeless people in the same category and we withdraw. And, 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 and we, we don't do, listen to me, just think about it. What, what really would be one of the most basic Christian responses that you could imagine for somebody who is impoverished or without. But we wash our hands of it because we put everybody in the same bucket because there are some abuses out there and we don't want to feed the abuses and we don't want to be taken advantage of. Well, guess what? That's exactly what was happening here. There were sincere evangelists, apostles, other Christian brothers and sisters traveling, but there were some abusers. But some of these believers, had, they had gotten taken advantage of before. They had been hurt. And so some of them, some of them were saying, yeah, we're just not going to get involved. I don't know how to separate the good from the bad or really be discerning in that. So I'm just not, I'm not going to do anything. There were other believers that were saying, you know, we're supposed to do this. I'm going to say in the game, but I'm sure not going to like it. Read the verse in verse eight. Uh, I mean, verse nine, be hospitable to one another without complaining. Do it graciously. So you understand what Peter does? He says, love one another. You know, and, and love, as you know, it, it overlooks a lot of sins. Uh, by the way, let me mention this situation to you. So I want to ask you today, how are you doing with your hospitality? How are you doing with your graciousness toward other believers? Have you withdrawn, washed your hands because there are some abusers, and certainly there are, people that would try to take advantage of you? People that would, you know, want to pull one, you know, pull one over on you? Have, have you put everybody in the same boat and you just say, well, you know, I'm not going to do it. Well, look at what Peter does right here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, no, this is on your to-do list. You're a believer in Christ. Christ has been gracious to you. And so you love one another, knowing that that means you've got to overlook some things. And oh, by the way, as you're showing hospitality to people, keep doing that. And don't be a complainer. Don't resent it. Yeah, you're going to take some hits. Yes, there are some risk. But love is always a risk, isn't it? Love is always a risk. And so Peter says, love one another graciously. I, I couldn't even begin to name all the possible applications to that. You can think about them in your life. What areas? For some of us, it, it might be how we look at poor people, homeless people. It may be in how we're using our homes and apartments or how we're not doing that to express love to other be believers. It might be, listen to me, it might be on how some of us are serving or not serving. You understand, we see abuses in the church. We, people, we see people take advantage of others in the church and we can look at that and say, you know, I'm not going to get involved because I, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to do that. Others may say, well, I know I'm supposed to serve and be in there, but do it like we do with our money sometimes and just grumble about it, really don't want to do it. And on and on we could go. Hear the word of the Lord. Love one another graciously, Brainerd. And this includes, by the way, not just folks here, but we have brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world, many of them impoverished, many of them homeless, many of them not knowing where their next meal is going to come from, many of them persecuted in prison. And this is something on our to-do list that calls us to make sure we are showing love for them. Item number three on our to-do list. So we pray for one another soberly. We love one another graciously. And Peter says, serve one another faithfully. Serve one another faithfully. It's interesting. This is actually what led us to this text as a group of preaching pastors in the first place because we knew we were going to be teaching on serving. And so this, this text talks about it. And the problem is it talks a lot, a lot more than that. This is only one of the things on the list, but come in here real close, beloved. It is on the list. And let me just remind you, this is a response to this issue of how you live godly while you're waiting for Jesus to come. 
Make sure you connect it. Make sure we keep it in its context. And what Peter says here is that we are compelled to serve. Now, he unpacks it using some of the same words Paul did. The word gifts in verse 10 is that word from which we get our word charismatic. It's this, this, this reality of, of grace deposits that God makes in our lives to enable us to serve so that together we are the body of Christ and we put Jesus on display and show the world what he looks like accurately. Paul's, you know, Peter's using the same terminology. Notice some other things that he said. And he says... He says, each one of us has got some. You see that in verse 10, just as each one has received a gift. Nobody gets a pass. None of us gets to say, I was absent the day they handed out spiritual gifts. So I really can't make a contribution. I can't do anything. Peter says, no. Jesus given this through his spirit to each one. And, and notice what it's for. It is for serving others. Now, let me call your attention to what Peter doesn't do in this text. He doesn't list a bunch of spiritual gifts. You know, we, we kind of like that. We like him to list the gifts and then let's try to figure out which ones are which and which ones we have and everything. He's, he's not doing that here. And, and, and he's not doing it because he has a larger purpose that I don't want you to miss. You say, well, what is it? Well, it's reflected in a thread that runs all the way to, through these two verses. Let me show it to you. Verse 9, he's going to mention the grace of God. Verse 11, he's going to mention the words of God. Verse 11, the strength of God. And verse 11, the glory of God. You see that? Repetition always helps us to think about meaning. Why is he saying what he's saying at this point? Because he wants us to understand this. All of us have been given these deposits of grace so that we can serve one another and every bit of our service, watch it now, is a faith response to God. I call your attention to that because I want you to understand this is not about filling a position. It's not about helping out. It's not about, especially on a guilt trip, well, I just need to get involved and do my part over there, Brainerd. The stakes are higher here. Peter wants us to understand this is part of godly living. This is part of godly living, and you're to wait for Christ's return in godly living. This is part of it. And this thing of spiritual gifts is God-focused from beginning to end. So he tells us some ways that we do that, not, not by listing a bunch of gifts, but by just identifying a couple of broad categories. One of them is speaking and one of them is serving. All gifts involve both of those to some degree, but he just basically puts them in two categories and said there are some gifts that, you know, where they just require and they involve people ministering to others through their speech. And so that would include preaching and teaching, certainly. It would include prophecy and tongues and, you know, in, in, in any ways that we speak. And then he takes everything else and he puts it in another category. This is all service, but, you, you know, your, your gift, your area of service doesn't involve and primarily driven by speaking. And he puts them in those two categories. And what Peter helps us to do is know how we operate in each of those categories in order to glorify God and express godliness in our love for one another. So let me show you how we do it. First of all, we do it by stewarding God's grace. You, you see, the, the, the God focus in verse 10 is the grace of God. And Peter describes it, look at this. In my English translation, he says, the varied grace of God. That word in the language of the New Testament means many faceted. Many colored, it actually, just think about a color palette. You see all those colors and how they blend together. And, you know, when they're overlapping there, there's a different color. It creates a different color. And it's almost like there's an infinite number of colors. Peter takes that word and he describes the grace of God. He says the grace of God is so multifaceted. It is so multi, it is so multicolored. And you know what that means? It's going to show up in so many different ways. This is one of the reasons, just one, but it's one of the reasons that I don't think all of the spiritual gifts are listed in Scripture because I don't think that you can describe and categorize this grace of God that is varied, many-colored, many-faceted with one list of 22. 
And I want to say that as an encouragement because some of you are trying to figure out, well, you know, which, which of those words, what, what gift do I have? Let me just tell you, the grace of God in your life is multifaceted. It is many colored and it expresses itself in an infinite number of ways. Peter, knowing that, says, you're a steward of that. Do you see it there in verse 10? The word steward was a reference to a, a servant in a household who had administrative responsibilities manage certain things in order for certain things to get, get, get done. Some of you are saying, hey, I don't want to be in charge of anything. I'm not a good administrator. I can't even keep one of those to-do lists. What is a to-do list, by the way? You know, I, I don't even know what. I, I, I'm just not organized. I can't do that. You know what? That, this passage is not saying you're supposed to lead a whole ministry like this. What it is saying is you have been entrusted with the grace of God that's been put in your life, and you are to manage it in such a way that is used to serve others. So we serve one another faithfully by stewarding the grace of God. Secondly, we serve one another faithfully by speaking the words of God. So he says in verse 10, if anyone speaks, those of you in that category, he says, let it be as one who speaks God's words. The word words, this is a word that could be translated oracles. It just meant sayings, God's sayings to mankind. Let me put this as simply as I can. Peter says, those of you that have gifts and ministries in which you speak God's word, you better make sure you are saying what God said. That's what he says. Those who are speaking, make sure, he says, as you approach this as one who is speaking on behalf of God. So preaching and teaching and tongues and prophecies, all of those were in our gifts in which people assume that God is speaking. And you know what that means? There's some of you here that preach and teach God's word. Hear the word of the Lord today. Here's how we serve one another faithfully. Here's how we respond to God in faith in this. We make sure that when we open our mouths, we are saying what he said. This is why, Brainerd, this is why we as a church are committed to what we call expository preaching. You know why? Because expository means to expose. And to expose means we are seeking to expose in every text of Scripture what God says. And this ought to be the case in every Bible study. It ought to be the case in every sermon. That's why we don't come in here and, and just do talk, motivational talks on hot topics and, and, and felt needs. Because the only chance that any of us have to have our lives transformed is to hear the voice of God. And that ought to impact the way we teach it and we preach it so that every time we come to Scripture, we're making sure that we find out what God is saying and we communicate what God is saying. And, and, and I would say, I would say if any of you end up on this church's search team looking for a new pastor, understand this, this church charges you with the responsibility of going out there and finding a brother that will do that, that will make sure Every time he preaches, he is saying what God says. This is why, beloved, this is why I, I, I invite you and even plead with you, bring your Bibles to this time. This is not a spectator sport. We still live in a country where we can carry these things around and own them. Bring them here. Open them up. Follow along when the Word of God is taught and preached. Why? Because this is not a sermon this is an opportunity to hear the very voice of God. Let's take every chance we have and let's put all of our energy into making that happen as listeners, but as speakers, teachers, and preachers. The weight is on us right here that every time we speak in these ministries, we're making sure we're saying what God says. We serve one another faithfully, thirdly, by serving in God's strength. It's what he says in the middle of verse 11. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides. It's easy, isn't it? Those of you that are serving and have served, you know this. It's easy to get in a routine to the point that you forget this is a spiritual enterprise. That you forget that the only way we're able to do this is because God had given us the grace He's the one that put this in our life. And therefore, the only way anything otherworldly is going to happen, 
anything supernatural is going to take place in this is that if we are dependent on and desperate for God's strength and his help in this, let's don't ever lose it. So even if you're serving in a capacity that doesn't involve speaking gifts, preaching and teaching, if you're greeting, you're changing diapers, you're serving in a, in, in a food line, you're stacking chairs, whatever it is we do, no, there's just an infinite number of ways, as I said, that this plays out. Remember, we can do this in the same strength of the world. We go through the motions and we can even see some success in those things, but that can deceive us into thinking that spiritual things are happening. The body is being built up. Believers in Christ are being encouraged. The only way those things are going to happen is if we are utterly desperate for and dependent on God to strengthen us through the grace that he gives to us. Finally, we serve faithfully by seeking God's glory. That's where all this ends. It's a purpose clause toward the end of verse 11. So that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. And Peter just enters into a personal worship service there, which reflecting on the grace of God and the goodness of God will always do. And he just says to him, be the glory and the power forever and ever. He's just caught up in contemplating that God has wired this thing in order for him to get glory by us putting Jesus on display through our service as parts of the body. And once again... Those of us who serve, those of you who have served, you know this, that somewhere along the way it's easy. It's, a, it's easy to begin seeing this as our ministry. And it's easy not only for us to do it in our strength, but to do it because we like the attention that it brings to us. I've been so blessed and encouraged by this church. There's so many of you that speak words of encouragement, some of you on a regular basis. And I want so badly every time I hear that to, to know that it's because both of us understand that God is the one that has spoken and it's his word and it's for his glory. But I got to tell you, I, 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 I like it. I like it when someone in sincerity is encouraging me. I, I like it when they compliment me. I, I like it when they, they say good sermon. I like it when they say, you know, thanks for, you know, for teaching us today. And there's a fine line in there for Jim Shaddix, a fine line between serving in this way, driven by and motivated by the glory of God and serving in this way for the glory of God of Jim Shaddix. Peter knows that danger. And this is why he brings us to this place. And when we see him, we see him remind us that it's for God's glory. And we see him, we see him get caught up in the grace of God and the glory of God, just thinking about it. We can but say what he says at the end of this verse. Amen. Amen. I agree with that. That is True, this word means. And I trust, brothers and sisters in Christ, today we would say amen to all of this, to the fact that we're waiting for Jesus to come back any day. And as we're waiting, we're compelled to godly living. And godly living means that we pray for one another soberly. And it means that we serve one another faithfully. And it, it means that we love one another graciously. All of this to the end that he might be put on display. Let's pray together. And ask our musical worship leaders to come in just a moment. We're going to finish our service by, uh, like we normally do, and standing and singing and worshiping our Lord. Last part of this verse is a great, great segue for us. But would you just talk, take a moment maybe to do what Peter does in verse 11? Would you just enter into a personal worship service before we jump back into corporate worship right there at your seat in your heart of hearts? 
Would you look at your life through the lens of this to-do list this today? Those of you that are serving and plugged in and very involved, let's check our motives, check our heartbeat. Let's check and see if we've presumed on some of these things and we've just kicked into autopilot, just assuming these things are gonna keep happening till Jesus comes. Maybe for us, by God's grace today, we would ask him to help us be proactive, take the initiative, make sure we're constantly aware of these tasks and these opportunities. For some of us, that evaluation may reveal some areas where we have washed our hands of things that are just fundamentally Christian helping people, loving people, having compassion on people, being gracious to people. Maybe for some of us, that's even gone as far as to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not gonna be involved. I'm not gonna help out. And maybe our worship today is repentance and trust and that the God who lives inside of us will enable us. And then for one other group of people, maybe your personal worship service has more to do with just whether or not you're a child of God. If you came here without Christ today, you've been gracious to patiently overhear this conversation between Christians, but maybe God has shown you the gospel today and you sense in your heart he's drawing you to himself in repentance and faith. Right there at your seat in your heart of hearts, I pray. Pray that you would say to him in your own words, I know I'm a sinner, separated from you because of my sin, but I now understand what Jesus did for me. And today I trust Jesus. I trust Jesus to forgive my sins and I trust him to put the life of God back inside of me that I might live for him. If that's what your heartbeat is today, that's what your heart's telling you. Pray you'd do that. And I pray you'd let somebody know about it before you leave this property today. God, help us with these things. You are worthy of our worship. You are great and you're glorious. You're gracious. Help us to display Christ in these last days to one another and to the world. For it's in his name we pray. Would you stand to your feet? Let's worship the Lord together through song.
declaration this morning. We'll build our lives upon his word. It's sure, it's firm, it's steadfast. We will live in obedience to him and to his word. Come on church, let's sing this out. such a joy, such a blessing to worship with you guys each and every Sunday. On behalf of Brainerd staff and volunteers, we want you guys to know how thankful, thankful we are for you guys, especially with Thanksgiving coming up this week. We are so incredibly thankful that you guys continue to come and worship with us on every Sunday. Uh, we got a couple announcements before you guys jump out of here real quick. The first, if you are a guest, if you've been attending Brainerd for maybe a few weeks or you're brand new and you want more information about the church, please text BB Guest to 97000. That's 97 with three zeros. We'd love to connect with you, get more information. 
uh, about Brainerd and what's going on here. Secondly, there's been a survey about serving that's kind of gone around for the past couple weeks. If you haven't had the chance to fill that out, we'd strongly encourage you to do so. Again, you can text uh, 97000, text that number, text BB Commit to that number. It gives us a, a better understanding of who's serving and where people are currently serving. And on that same thread, if you guys, uh, as we've gone through this sermon series, feel convicted or are wrestling through in your time with the Lord about where God is calling you to serve here at Brainerd, we'd encourage you to go talk to some of our volunteers out in the lobby. They'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have, explain the needs that we have and line up some times that you guys might be able to plug in and serve. And then lastly, and most importantly, we do have our members meeting uh, this, this evening at 5 p.m. in the sanctuary and it's also online. It's a very important business meeting that we're gonna have regarding the future of our church uh, as we continue to look for a head pastor. So if you are a member, we'd strongly encourage you to tune in uh, or come down to the sanctuary and be a part of that. And then lastly, we leave you with the same prayer that we give you every week. May God be gracious to you and bless you. May he make his face shine upon you so that his way may be known to the nations and his salvation amongst the nations. His way to be people and nations, it doesn't matter. You guys are good. Go ahead, stack some chairs. We're short-handed on staff. So if you guys could stack some chairs, we'd love it. Have a great Thanksgiving. <laughs>